My name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode 10. Yes, we've reached episode 10 of our video series in which we answer your wildlife photography questions. Now, it's been quite a while. The last while has been rather, let's call it interesting for me. We, Big Cat was phenomenal. If you've been following Instagram, here's my link, click up here. Um, you'll see the adventures we had behind the scenes. It was an amazing trip. However, I can with um, a reasonable amount of certainty tell you that tick bite fever really, really, really sucks. It is not cool. Yeah, somewhere along the line, a tick got me on the hip, but I'm glad to say that I'm fighting on and I've made it through. Still feeling a bit dodged, but hey, you gotta keep moving. So, episode 10, we, um, we got quite a few questions lined up. I'm gonna do eight of them today. Andrew's helping with a couple of them. And then, yeah, I've got 11 and 12 lined up as well. So it's going really, really well. Thanks to you guys for sending all the questions. It's been a while, but let's get right back into it. Kim on Facebook asked, okay, Andrew, this one's for you. You never wrote to me to let me know about the s'mores. What'd you think? Did you like them? Hate them? So Kim, s'mores. Well, first of all, thank you and Nancy for sending them down and bringing them along with you on safari with us. Um, how were they? Sweet. Now, in a South African term, that's a, it's a kind of a slang for saying they were great, but they literally were sweet. <laughs> um, it was a sugar overload of note, and um, it was exactly what I needed after you know a couple of days in the bush. You don't often get to have those little treats. Whilst the guys do put chocolates and that sort of thing on your pillow, um, they never seem to be enough for me. So they were really, really good. I know a couple of the, the Kenyan staff couldn't believe how sweet they were. The guys really aren't used to sugar and that sort of stuff. So I think it was a bit of a surprise to them. But uh, yeah, definitely something that I'd have again. Um, I think in combination with a bit of Nutella, perhaps. We can throw that in there. There's always Nutella, isn't there? Of course. Yeah, but they were very good. And thank you very much for bringing them along. Did you guys take them along with you on Big Cats this time? Jerry, did they have them? No. 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 It was hmm. very disappointing. Very disappointing. A couple of comments made, apparently. All right, so there you have it. They were very good. And you'll need to bring them out next time you come on safari with us. Andrew on email asks, Jerry, if you went on a wild eye photographic safari and a few weeks or months later, you had 10 days available in South Africa to do a self-drive safari, what would your travel itinerary be in terms of diversity? Andrew, good and interesting question, but as with a lot of these, I think I'm probably gonna answer it with another question for you. If I have 10 days, where do I go for diversity? If my goal was to photograph diversity, I'll dig into that now. Then I can look at places that will offer me different types of terrain, different, what should we say, different types of animals, different types of light even, because I mean, those things change from place to place. If I had 10 days, especially after, look, if I was a guest and I came on a wildlife photo safari, and three months later I do my own trip, I would hopefully, and well, I can almost say with certainty, I will know, well, I would have learned a couple of new tips, new, new tricks that I could use, so I would look at a place, for me, if I had 10 days, I would probably not go to various places, three nights, three nights, four nights, like you mentioned. I'd probably end up going just to one place. I would have a focus. If it's leopards, I might want to go to Sabi Sands. Um, if I want to create images of an area, Khalakhari always spoken to me, there's something special about it. I don't get there often enough, unfortunately. But that would probably be for me. If I could take, on my own, 10 days, I never get that. But... I would probably look at a place like the Khalakhari, go and spend 10 days and capture the diversity of the area. That for me would be more focused. I mean, we, we say it on all the trips and we've, we've spoken about this in the past that you can go to 15 places in a matter of two weeks and literally go one night, one night, one night, one night. You're not gonna get great images. No, cancel that. You might get great images if you get lucky. However, the images we're all after, the moments and the wildlife sightings we're all after is based on spending time in an area. The longer you spend time in an area, the better your images are gonna be. You start understanding the rhythm of the area. There's a lot to be said for that. I mean, people, we had someone in the office yesterday looking at a Mara trip and we show them some images and they think, oh wow, is that on one? No, it's not on one trip. That is over a good couple of years, but that's what's possible. So, Andrew, do you want to create images of an area that kind of tells a story? I would go and spend one place. For me right now, probably Khalakhadi because I don't get there often enough. If I had to go and I had to choose three different places, I would probably look at somewhere in the low felt, somewhere towards the Kalahari, um, maybe something like your Tualu, Kalahari could count for me. And then I would, I would even be tempted to look at more of a landscape type Cape Town vibe because 
If I have 10 days in South Africa, I would want to tell the story of South Africa. Low felt as a must, the Kruger area. I wouldn't go Kruger, I would go more private so I can work my sightings and my shots. Um, something like the Kalahari, Kalahari, um, oh, Central Kalahari is not in us. Uh, something like Tualu, where I could get very different types of images. Remember, a lion image in the sands, in the Mara, in Kalahari is very different because of the backgrounds. Um, that's also why you don't want to shoot long lenses all the time, to tell the story. But, and then I would probably look at something like a Cape Town area to tell the complete story coming from a tourism and travel background. I would want to show people the country. So I would try and get destinations that shows a little bit of everything. That's if I have to move around. Again, my choice would be one area and work it for my shots. Sarah on Facebook asks, is it best to try to change behavior by boycott, sanctions, etc., to make your point, or to support those in the country doing the right thing? Sure. Sarah, this is a deep one. Um, I'm going to ask Andrew to help me out after this. The thought for me, I mean, people, I think number one, the media over-sensationalized things. Um, I think people who sit on Facebook and post pictures of rhinos being poached and want the world to change because they've done that, it's not going to happen. You're fooling yourself if you think it is. But to boycott a whole country, I don't think there's, there's, there's no point there really. I mean, is if you know a certain operator is doing something that you don't agree with, absolutely don't use them. Boycott them. And just by doing that, you might have been doing your part. I would want to go there and I would want to support the people that I know do good work. And I would... One, two, look, again, we spoke about this in episode three or four. I'm not a conservation photographer because there's, you need to do something specifically with it. But I would like to think that the images I create, the experience I create for someone with an operator in a specific country can and will make a difference. Am I going to boycott someone? No. Am I going to... Uh, look, we check our operators. Hello, Laura. I check my operators, and I, but, but to boycott someone outright, that sounds a bit harsh. Um... Can what we do make a difference? Yes, I think it can, if you tell the real story. But um, sure, this is one we can get kind of deep and stuck into, but yeah, that's me. I would want to go to people who do the right work, support them, and by support them, I would take my clients there, I would go and shoot them myself, and use the content we create there to help them to continue doing the right work, give them the visuals to work with. But um, to sit back and just say, rah, rah, if you never go to the place, Ah, that sits bad with me. You need to get involved or stay out the way so other people can do their work. My thoughts. See what Andrew has to say. Sarah, this is, a, as you mentioned, quite a complex question. Um, my personal thoughts on it, and you, you've kind of gone on the right track in terms of supporting operators and people that are doing the right things. And you mentioned that you perhaps then condone that sort of behavior by visiting the country. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think by supporting the operators that are doing the, the right thing, you can hopefully instill a, a bit of a movement of change whereby the people who don't necessarily um, toe the line when it comes to these things or operate outside of the rules and regulations or what is acceptable um, will actually then no longer be able to support themselves because they are not getting the traffic and the business from um, uh, the, the operators that are, are, are actually doing things the right way. I think if you were to look at it on a bigger picture and start to look at it and say, right, which countries, and wildlife aside, um, you know, in terms of cultural practices, political practices, all sorts of things, if you were to start to look at all the negative things in the world and what goes wrong, where would you end up being able to travel without kind of theoretically then supporting any of those um, practices? So, you know, Africa is a complex place. There's a lot of culture, there's a lot of history, there's um, so many different things at play here. And it's often, you know, the information that is put out on things like social media or the media in general is often quite sensationalist. And, you know, there's no shortage of um, campaigns to sign up and stop this and do that. But in, in essence, it's all slacktivism and it actually has no real impact um, for the vast majority of, of those kind of campaigns. But I think, you know, if, you, if it's something that's very close to your heart and that you're passionate about and you really want to understand, I think you've got to do a fair amount of research to actually get a really good understanding of what goes on on the ground. And often it's only a visit to that area to have a better understanding of what's happening that will be able to provide you with that information. So 
on a whole, you know, something like Zimbabwe, um, you know, do you boycott the destination completely? Look, some of the money might go into Uncle Bob's hands, but uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of good work being done out there by a lot of good people who are trying to make the change and trying to instill a movement of change. And the only the way that they can actually make that um, is if it's supported by the global community. So to boycott a destination outright, I think, is a bit harsh. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of subtleties in, in terms of what is actually going on on the ground and how to get around it. But I would say that we should be supporting the operators that are doing the right things um, and boycotting the operators that are not doing the right things and not using them. But to take it up to a country level, I think, becomes quite difficult. Um, like I said, if you were to look at it in that way, you know, where in the world would you travel? Not many options left, I think, the way that uh, society behaves and, um, and with politics and that sort of stuff at the moment. So, yeah, that's my take on it. Caroline Email asks, when one feels they are ready to go one step further than just put their fo photos on their Facebook page, how does one open their own photo page and where or how? Carol, this is a very, very good question and really something that I think a lot of people don't quite understand. In the beginning, when Facebook had just, just started off, you could only create a personal page. And a lot of us, myself included, I had Photo Africa back then, I, um, I used my personal profile to market the business, if you will, put out images, create content out there. But it was limited to 5,000 friends. Friends, yeah. Um, but now, with the, with the business pages, it's an absolute must. So the, the short version, I'm gonna just go off on a tangent in a second here. The short version is to create that page. You log into Facebook, at the top next to the search bar, click next to your, click on your profile, so it goes to your name, and then I'll put a screenshot in here for you now. Click on the little triangle at the top, a drop down will come down and you just hit create page. And then you just follow the steps all the way through. Now, the more important thing and the more interesting discussion, and it's funny none of you have asked this, is how do I use my Facebook page to create an awareness and to, um, and to get my work out there. Because here's the thing, a lot of people putting out just wildlife images. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that just putting out images makes you look like everybody else. Scroll through Facebook, depending on who you're following, and you'll see lion image, lion image, leopard image, it's all the same. We get desensitized, number one, but number two, for your image to stop someone, I mean, we live here, yes? Scroll, scroll. If you can't catch my attention in the time I've scrolled through you, it's gone. So you need to find, first of all, you need to define for yourself why you want that page. I think it's a great idea. I've heard recently some photographers are saying, I'm gonna close my page and take it back to my personal page. Why? The amount of business tools that you have, you can schedule, you can get statistics on your posts. You can, if you need to boost them, you can boost them. You can create a whole bunch of different types of content and you can manage that process better than on a personal page. So it makes no sense to me to close your business page. However, you need to see and understand for yourself what your value proposition is on your page and why people should come to it. Do you want to sell prints? A lot of people are trying to do that. It's a bit stale as well, I think. Um, do you want to create value? Do you want to put out blog posts? Or do you just want a place where your personal profile is something which you share with your friends that you've actually met, real friends, um, and then you can put things on your dogs having breakfast and you just went to gym. Whereas on your business page, business photography page, that's where you create your images. Whether you have two or 200 followers, that is where people can come to see your work. So that's a very good idea. Amateur professional, you need to have it. I think it's a great thing to have. But, and this is something, don't get caught in this trap. People think of numbers as the end goal. So you have 200,000 followers on Facebook. Nobody gives a shit. At the end of the day, people care about you and your images. If your goal is to get numbers, you're doing it for the wrong reason. I know people who have more than 200,000 followers, yet can they execute and make people buy a print, book a trip, get in touch, book them for a talk, whatever the case is? No, because they've paid for most of those followers and people know them just as someone, nice picture, type wow, end of story. Right, so define for yourself what you wanna do with your page and stick to your guns. You're not gonna have 5,000 followers in a matter of a week. You can pay for them, but you don't want five million people from China or from India or any of these countries who just sign up for nothing and they just say, comment, I like, I'm getting very excited, like, 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 wow, great photography. There's no value in that. 
Give value, your value that you can create, and people will follow you because of that. Those are the real followers that you want. And that's how you create a Facebook page. Daniel in email asks, can you explain to me what happens in real life if I use a lens with extenders? Daniel, thank you so much. Interesting one because converters come up very often on trips, discussions, phone calls, and so on. What we must understand here is I would personally not. Remember now, if I take, okay, not this lens, but if I take a lens, I stick a converter. It's a small converter that goes in between this and my camera. If I put a converter on here, it doesn't change the physical aperture. The aperture, as we know, it's the hole going open and closed, yes? So for it to change, for example, from a 5.6 to a 6.3, whatever it might be, when you stick the converter on, it doesn't mean the lens now suddenly opens and closes to a different size, no. The relationship, because remember, depth of field and aperture and these things, they all work together. So the relationship between the size that that hole opens in your lens, your aperture, versus the distance now from your sensor, there's a converter in here, is longer. So the relationship changes and that's why less light can come in. It takes more time and that has to compensate for it. Now, I would personally not put a converter on anything other than a prime lens, a fixed 300, a fixed 400, or a fixed 600, because of the quality. There is a certain amount of, you can say what you want, there's a certain amount of drop of quality when you put a converter, whether a 1.4 or a two ton. The quality does drop a little bit. So, um, is it worth a tool to have? Absolutely. But on the lens that you mentioned, I wouldn't really want to put a lens, I mean, if you're already at 5.6 at, at, your, at your widest open, you don't want to drop to 6.3 or 7.1 or whatever it is when you put that converter on, because your depth of field will then be fixed, yes, depth of field, we understand that, but I don't think the drop, drop of quality, oh, is it John? I don't think the drop of quality is worth it on a lens like that. To put a two times converter on a, what was it, 150, 500 or something, it's not worth it. Rather than get in tighter, use field craft to get closer, and that's going to be a better bet for me. But in reality, remember, the aperture doesn't change on your lens. It's the relationship of aperture versus distance from sensor to subject that changes when you put that converter in between. I hope that helps, Daniel. Otherwise, drop me a mail with more specific questions, maybe example images, and let's check it out from there. Ryan on email asks, I would love to get your take on enhancing contrasty, shadowy images in Lightroom, like the one I took of this male cheetah attached. Basically, what would you try to achieve with shadows and brushes, etc., especially when you might want to tell a story of the light hitting one side of the animal, or if you think not? Right, Ryan, this is a very interesting question because you talk about contrasty images. Now, from a, if you go, go and scroll through Facebook and you will see the photographers who are struggling with the concept of shadows, highlights, and contrast. People think that if you push that contrast slider in Lightroom up, it makes things better. Not always. There's, there's always a line when it's too much. Now remember this. You say you're worried about the shadows, especially on the front side. I'll, dro I'll drop this image in here for you. This is the image we're discussing. Um, the contrast in this off the bat as a raw file is not that bad. It's very natural looking. Now what people often want to do is they want to try and lift the contrast too much. Now remember, if you increase contrast, you're making darks darker and lights lighter. So the range of tonal values in that image increases. If you decrease the contrast, you're making the darks lighter and the lights darker, bringing them closer together, leaves a washed out image. In real life, when you look at that cheetah, there is shadow on the one side. There is a shadow underneath. Shadows gives you depth in an image and highlights defines it. That, that's kind of how photography works. Now, I don't think there's any issue with the way you process this. I think maybe the idea of contrast images, what, what I'll do is, I'll, as a separate video later on this week, I will do a quick run through of processing that image for you and we'll look at both too much, too little and correct amount of contrast in that image. Then we'll have a nice look. But the one thing you need to be careful of, your composite, you said in your, in your email, you said, please remember this now, you said that you only you didn't think of the light or the contrast when you shot. You only thought of the composition. It's a beautiful composition. I mean, the cheetah stretching on the log. But as one of your checks, when you're looking through your, view, your viewfinder, yes, there's a couple of things. I mean, make sure you double check your aperture, your shutter speed. Check the size of the frame to make sure nothing's dropping in that you have to clone out later on because it's just a waste of time. But um, also look at the shadows in the image. Shadows, like I said, gives you depth. 
Don't then try and ignore it. Either meter or expose for that. It creates depth and kind of mystery if it's the right image. When you then get to Lightroom, that shadow slider, effective as it, as it is, people overuse it completely. They try and think that they have to have detail in all the shadows and details in all the highlights. It's rubbish. You look at an image where the sun is in the frame. Your eyes can't see detail in that sun. Now you're expecting to bring detail back. Why? It doesn't work like that. We need to try and put images forth that are natural looking. As far as I'm concerned, this image, the JPEG that you sent through, is pretty natural looking. I mean, it was harsh light conditions, but I think you dealt with it pretty well overall. Um, like I said, I will do a run through on Lightroom and I'll post it later this week. Let's see what we can come up with. But overall, don't be scared of the shadows. Don't be scared. It's the dark side. Don't be scared of it. It's not as bad as in Star Wars. Murray on email asks, do you use back button focus? And if so, can you talk a bit about why and any tips and tricks when using it? Murray, the short answer is yes, absolutely I use back button focus. Now, I'm gonna link, go to YouTube if you're viewing this anywhere else. In the description, I'll put a link to a blog that Andrew did a while ago. I think there was two, Andrew. There was the how and then on, on the back button focus blogs. Yeah, there's how, how to set it up, yeah. why, Okay. So Andrew's actually answered this for me. How, why, and benefits. So I'll link in the description on YouTube. I'll give you the link to these blog posts. Go and check them out. Short version for me. I love back button focus because I don't have to change. So on, on Nikon, I go to AFC, continuous focus. I disengage the focus on my shutter button. On Canon, if I'm shooting Canon, I will go to AI servo. And again, I will disengage the shutter button as a focus mechanism. The reason is, Leopard walks straight towards me. I can focus on him and hold the back button down. As long as I keep that button down, I can fire and the camera will track that animal. That animal stops, I can just let go, the back button focus, keep firing because my focus has been set. Yep, he starts moving again, I just keep on going. For moving subjects and for stationary subjects in wildlife, I find it the easiest way to think and focus on the run. It makes a huge difference. So, if you have specific questions on scenarios, send them through to me. Otherwise, go and check out Andrew's blogs. Great content on there. That should answer it for you. But again, my short answer to your question is yes. Sarah on email asks, do you ever use auto ISO or do you always choose the ISO yourself? Sarah, this is an interesting one because I know a lot of people, especially on the new cameras, like I said, a lot of people choose to use auto ISO um, and buffer it. For example, you tell the camera, don't go lower than 200 and don't go higher than, I don't know, 3200 or whatever the case is. I think there's actually a blog post. While I was away, I saw a blog post on that. Morkel. Morkel posted a blog on this. So I'll, I'll add the link to that as well. I personally, look, maybe I'm old school, but I like the idea of controlling everything. I'm not a control freak, make no mistake. Well, sometimes. No, I'm not really. But I like to control what I do in camera. So I would, for example, I would set my ISO, and I'm lazy, uh, this is the thing. I would set my ISO to like an 800 on a Nikon D3S or a 1DX, whatever I'm shooting, and keep it there because I know, in a previous question I mentioned, I've got a certain checklist in my mind before I click that shutter. One of them for me is double check. I drop down to the bottom, I check my shutter speed, and I come back up, so I know what I'm dealing with. I also play a lot, a huge amount, with my shutter speed. By changing aperture, I can drop my shutter speed down to go into that artistic slow shutter speed area. I quite enjoy that. Um, so for me, I don't know. I, I just haven't really played with auto. I get it. I get why some people want to, might want to do that. I just haven't gotten it. Johnny, do you shoot in auto ISO? No. No, Johnny doesn't shoot in auto ISO. So, same reason, just what, get lazy. I, I'm, I get lazy. Well, I don't know. I just want to be able to control it for me. Yeah. Camera controlling it, I like to control it. There it is. So if you understand, I think, the relationship between aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, I want to set, look, I mean, I can give you a graph. If you guys want a graph, let me know, because you need to ask me more questions. There's an inverted U graph where your ISO starts high in the day if you're doing it manually. It comes down during the day, and then it goes up as the light drops again. I'm comfortable working like that, and it gives me more of a sense of control. And do I mess it up from time to time? Absolutely, it happens. But I still, I don't like the idea of the camera doing it for me. Again, there's no right or wrong, that's me. Go and check out Morkel's blog post. I must be honest, I've just come back and like I said, I've been sick, I don't know what the hell's going on, but it's on the blog. But for me, I set my ISO, I will start high in the mornings as the light progresses. 
See, I'm comfortable leaving my cameras between four and 800 throughout the day. Some of you are thinking, oh my God, you're gonna get noise. No, I won't because noise hides in dark areas. In the day when there's lots of light, it's not really a problem. And with the noise reduction, understanding noise reduction, I can take it out pretty easily after the fact. So for me, Sarah, no, I do, I set my ISO because I check it all the time. It's like my matrix, remember my photography matrix? Um, but auto, there's nothing wrong with it. Understand your tools, either one can work, it's up to you. Read the blog, my answer is I choose to do it for myself. Right, that's it for this week. That is episode 10 in the bag. Now, um, the next episode is, come, is gonna come exclusively off Instagram. I posted an image on my Instagram feed, I'll link it again for you over here. Um, go and check out the Instagram feed. I'm gonna post it one more time. All the images are oh, images, well, Instagram images. You need to be on Instagram, by the way. It is a phenomenal platform, but know how to use it. Ask me the question. Um, I am, so you know, I've lost my chain of thought. I've had tick bite fever, that's why. Give me a moment. <laughs> oh, the next questions for episode 11 will come exclusively off Instagram. I already have a five or six on the one post from a couple of weeks ago. And if you have any, I'm gonna post one on my Instagram feed today. So go and pop into Instagram if you're there, ask me more questions and let's dig even deeper. There's a lot of questions I'm quite surprised people haven't asked yet. Let's see if we can get to them. We'll give you more tips and ideas as we go along. Anyway, I'm in the office now. I was supposed to be in Medikwe now, but being a little bit fevery and stuff, um, I've been able to, um, Penny's taking my clients up there. So yeah, I'm in the office for a good, what are we looking at here? Maybe four or five weeks now. So lots of content coming your way, but I need more questions. So again, tomorrow I'm gonna do stuff straight off Instagram, ask your questions there. I also wanna do a specific Lightroom and post-processing episode where I'm gonna take about three or four images that you guys sent me and questions that you sent me and do a whole bunch of short tutorials to look at the post-processing side of wildlife photography. There's a lot of questions you can ask, send them through and I will keep on answering them for you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I will see you next time.